The value of life for autonomous car safety contains a eugenic correction factor based on the <laughs> DNA profile. Mm. Plausible, I think not um, likely. I think if you're going to have an AI controlling uh, eugenics via the, like the DNA profile and the, whatever factors have been programmed into it to optimize, I think that that will be expressed as policy. Oh, see, I'm doing the same thing as with the other one. Um, I, it, it would probably be, where would you insert that? Probably somewhere you wouldn't expect. To keep it, to keep it as, like so, somewhere that's just not interesting to, to humans, so they won't have enough interest to look into it. Oh, so you're saying you wouldn't put the correction factor there, you put it somewhere else in the algorithm that does the same thing. Somewhere else in the, the but that's social basically, pipeline. That you... That's why I'm saying anyway. But it just doesn't make, it's not a funny thing if you just say, oh yeah, but they won't do it like that, they'll do it in a different way. That's, of course, that's the obvious answer. That's my That's what I said, I'm sorry, I was, I, was, I was doing the same thing as before. Yeah, Agreed. so boring. God damn it. Okay, you have to do better with this one. Alright. Okay. Uh, let me find a good one. Okay, this is quite a good one. Philosophy is autonomously, selectively deconstructed to suit special interests. So this is like... So, can, you just, can you explain what you mean by autonomy in this case? Oh. Autonomous tactical nihilism. So they they got an AI that perfects tactical nihilism, and they use it against whoever who is is annoying them at the time. That is human behavior in a nutshell. Wow, I thought I was black. Though. That's really that's a really intense thing to say. Well, man is a political animal, and that is how you do political argumentation on an individual basis. Is that what I do? Do I do that a lot? Would you say that about me? I try and cut through that. I try and make it interesting. I try and find the juicy bits of the thing. But maybe I am just like a hypocrite, just like everyone else. But I don't try. I try. I try not to do that. I try to take it to the interesting of it, to the new level, like we're doing now. <laughs> but. But am, am I? How how much of a political animal am I? Would you say? Be honest. I would have to feel out that question. I would I would say most of it, uh, between ninety and hundred percent. Okay, I, that makes me feel bad. But does that make me a bad person? It it's entirely normal. But that's not what you're at. You're you're. Oh man, yeah, you're probably right. Oh well. I, but I, I, I don't know. I try and fight on the good team, you know, the people doing the good, the good things. But I guess that's what everyone says again, and then it's just language. See, the problem is, you get to a certain point. Language, it doesn't mean anything, because even as we're exploring all these different ideas, it's kind of like all you're saying is, yeah, it's happening already. It's gonna happen. Right, that, that that's fatalism, I get that. But, and then it sort of, it just sort of kills the joke. I'm trying to have, I'm trying to like make it funny, and I'm just, I'm just finding, you're telling me I'm not funny, and it's just, I'm trying to be black-pilled, and it's just not working. Okay, next one. <laughs> 2040, autonomous gun turrets preemptively reduce human-initiated school shootings to zero with extreme prejudice. So we're not going to let the teachers have the guns because that is fascism. But we're going to put it in the all sentient AI, and it's going to, they're going to have autonomous gun turrets, and they're going to like feel out the the read people's thoughts, identify the fr the pre crime, and just take out the school shooters before they even know they're going to be school shooters. Okay. So I'm going to ignore my first instinct, which is to say that it would be done in a different way, and say yes, except in a far more agreeable way, since that is a trait, what's uh, a, what's highly selective trait in uh, how you... population dense society. And an agreeable. How can you do that agreeably, though? Well, how? Where would you start? 
You're you, you don't. You're a politician than I am. Because you're like, yeah, it'd be done agreeably. So you'd need to sort of influence these people to make it seem socially acceptable. Maybe run a few campaign ads. Okay. You know, hard, hard prison campaign here, ads. Here, get, the, a... get the Christian single mothers against school shootings. You know, get some lobbyist support. Here, here's know, an example go... from comments on, on the blog recently. If the, the, the difference between the autonomous turret taking out the, the school shooter and an agreeable way of doing that would be you don't you don't shoot him because that's not nice. You sedate and castrate. So pretty close to what we're doing already, except uh, a great deal more effectively. Does that make sense? Did I lose you? Ah, but maybe that means all turrets are more Machiavellian, but sedating and castrating is more like PC. Right, so maybe... it's very PC. I don't personally think it's a great deal more merciful, but if you're talking about the difference between an agreeable person and a disagreeable person, that is what they would prefer at, in, in a huge way. But what, so what would an, what would an EN, what... How would an ENTP think about the problem and an ESTP think about the problem? What would so the autonomous gun turret school shooting problem? You have your Republican ENTP, you have your Democrat ESTP. They're fighting for the state senators thing, and then the, and the autonomous gun turret thing is a key debating point in the in the election debates live televised. Talk us through that thought process. All right, the ENTP is always going to be in favor of autonomous robots with turrets and, and missiles to solve any sort of situation. <clears throat> so, let's say that they, they uh, oh man, it, it, it's hard to play your sort of, uh, of uh, mental games. Because I have to get all, I have to get outside my head. Okay, so they're going to be in favor of See, this is why the, the, it's the capitalist. This is why it's entertaining. You have to go, you have to run with it. You kind of have to lose yourself a little bit and run with it and go with it. See where it takes you. It's an experiment. Well, it's this a thought is... experiment. You want to control it. You're, you, like, imagine me, I'm Heath Ledger's Joker, and you're, you're sitting in bed and you've had half your face blown off. And, you know, you have to, you have to take a chance. You have to run right. with me on this. The... The Republican ENTP you're describing is the antagonist of Borderlands 2. Uh, his name is Jack something. And... The, okay, so the, the nicer one, the, let's say the Democratic EN, e, ESTP, would be... Come on, a, you're, you're, a, a, no, a former cheated. pharmaceutical rep. You cheated because what you did was you said the nicer one. But we both know neither side are nicer. They're both oh, just dealing right. with the same realities in a different way. It's a style thing. It's not who's nicer and who's not nicer. It's just... So change, don't, don't use the word nice. I object. I object. Your Honor, I object to the word nice. Is prejudicing the jury. <laughs> I, I I can't reliably keep up with that sort of thought process. I think I would need to be drinking. Reliably, it's not about reliably. It's a podcast, man. People listen to this for entertainment. They don't listen to it for reliability. Just run with it. So, ENTP, so you have your, your pharma CEO against your military contractor CEO, and military contractor CEO just sees no problem with just putting it all out there. Yes, we have the gun turrets with the correction, with the eugenic correction factors on the stickers on the side of them. No problem with that. <laughs> So what's the ESTP thing? So, so the ENTP, so there's a massive school shooting problem, and the ENTP suggests, okay, just autonomous gun turrets with eugenic correction factors. 
preempt, to preemptively score. He just scopes out the whole thing. He designs the perfect technical solution. And, and we're going to put and, the and, stickers and, on the side with all the variables that we're going to use to determine who to kill, where, where and when. And then he's like, and then everyone's like, yeah, we should probably do that. Oh, but it's, and then Christian single mothers against school shootings turns up and says, yeah, we should probably do it, but it's not nice. It's not a nice way to do it. So, right, so okay, the so ESTP guy nice puts up a video of the, the crying mother whose son was shot mistakenly because he, he wasn't holding a, uh, he wasn't shooting the, the kids in his class, he was shooting them with a squirt gun. So, and then the, the automated eugenic correcting turrets that you're describing cut him down and the, the ESTP politician says, this, this wasn't, this could have been avoided. This tragedy could have, and wouldn't it be better if we first uh, had the, the turrets shooting the tranquilizer darts? You know, so that we could sort out, like, was he really a, such a bad kid? Yeah, wouldn't it be was better that... if we put him on the tranquilizer darts and then uh, taped him to a stretcher and then took him to the mental facility and then drugged him up on, like, Zoloft for the rest of his life? Isn't that the more humane solution than just killing him? That type of thing. Right. Uh-huh. Am I still being too literal here? No, that's fine. I think we explored an interesting aspect today. And then I guess what you're saying in some in your blogs is that when the snake melon stuff just becomes too ridiculous, and then you're, the state is spending gazillions of dollars on all these sort of drugged up possible school shooters in in the mental facilities, then the the NTP comes along again and says you know, well, your ideas were stupid from the beginning, and look at how much debt we're in, and then and then the NTPs become like fiscal responsibility hawks. Right, it's a combination of actual costs and opportunity costs because the tranquilizers and psych facilities and so forth are selectively used for political purposes against, you know, people who aren't ESTP-like. Oh, so this is another interesting question how bad does it have to get to be before entp fiscal responsibility hawk assumes power assumes hard power and like what does it does it need to become like terminator robot apocalypse for that to happen if i had time on my hands and wanted to publish something of great significance i would look for the formula, which describes when war happens based on social mood, uh, area diversity, and uh, economic, uh, the GDP per capita, we'll say. So, okay. if what, what you're asking is fundamentally a quantitative question, and I would really like to know the answer, and I think that, for example, the Rothschilds actually do know the answer to that, but. But, like I assume that they have the numbers very, you know, to such and such uh, digits, uh, significant digits, and have a very clear idea of when that actually happens. But I, I just don't know. Okay, but it can be quantified with enough information. That would be good information Absolutely. to know if you know that. Would that would be a great social science study. You know, I asked a, an oil field CEO. He's a very famous chap. He has a, a knighthood. His name is Frank. Let's just call him Frank, Frankie. And I asked him, it was pre-financial crisis, and I was like, how's the financial crisis going to affect our corporation? What, what are you doing about it? And he said, he said, I don't know, but the person who does know is going to be very rich. Those were his exact words to that question. How about that? Smart yeah. guy. I, uh, I'll try to break down the, the factors of the, the equation really quick. So you got genetic distance, which describes how much of your selfish gene um, drive, we'll say, your, your, how much of your reproductive strategy is based on helping the people around you also reproduce and succeed and not die. So how, how much, like, if everybody around you is a, a genetic twin, then you're going to have a very uh, strong desire to get along with them versus compete with them for resources and such. So you got to talk about average genetic distance. Then you got to talk about how much stuff there actually is to go around. So that'd be your uh, GDP per, per capita. So just and, 
are, are we are we on the same team, Aoli? Would you say, or do, is our selfish gene similar enough? That's another quantitative question. Like, if it were a question of you or me, like we're in a fight to the death over a piece of chicken, which is the only thing left to eat. In the then... Terminator, okay, Terminator robot apocalypse. Well, I think we'd be on the same team. Yeah, me too. We're okay. We're very similar in that way. I mean, if okay. we're just talking strictly social Darwinism. Yeah. See, I'm not so. I'm the sort of political end of the business of your business. That's how I like to see myself. I'm, I'm the, the the smiling, friendly face of the corporation. And what would you say my business is? Because I'm curious. Your business is enlightening people to the dark side of the moon. Ooh, that's just about right. I have an addiction to articulating um, knowledge that is stored in. I, I would say attitudes. Yes. So that's a good way to put it. It's like unspoken knowledge. It's like what makes the thing tick. You look more deeply into it. See, I went through my whole life. I never touched the sides of the thing till I was like in my late twenties, because I didn't have to. It was so easy. But then I had to. So, you know, okay. that's a, that's another story though. So next question. Let's move on. That was fun though. I liked that. That 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 was good. That was good. So. Skynet AI autonomously creates an autonomous mashup of Battle Royale, The Cube, Elysium, and Hunger Games in the smart cities. I need that again. Oh, because you're not up on movies, are you? So I might have to even. Well, I know I know Hunger Games, and I know Elysium's from the that South Africa allegory, right? The the one with the city in the sky. Yeah, so you have the utopian city in the sky, and then the sort of depth groveling plebs living in their techno dystopia, in their sort of crappy manufacturing jobs where they just they are unsafe and insecure and blah blah blah. So that's Elysium. The Cube is like a horror movie where people get transplanted into a into like a maze where each room has like a different game they have to play to escape the maze, and. Uh, no, and, and like the moral of the story is like no one actually designed it. It was just built by some like government AI as part of a make work scheme, and then the right. government AI had to had to get people to use it for it to be. So it's just sort of some like remainder function of like organizing this many people who can't do very much type of thing. And Battle Royale is a Japanese movie where it's like young people and it's like Hunger Games but more horrific. And they send all these young people to an island and they're supposed to the death kind of thing. So, so smart right. cities. So this just leads to smart city. Everyone says, oh, the roads will be paved with gold. You'll take your autonomous Uber to the nightclub. You know, you'll get laid. And if you don't get laid, then there'll be some like beautiful lifelike. Robot to to get laid afterwards, and you'll go to your great job. It'll be just like a computer game. You'll get paid as much money as you want, and everything will be so efficient, and we won't pollute the environment, and blah blah blah. But, so, just to make sure I'm understanding, a smart city then would be one which is organized by AI principles. Yeah, AI principles. Everything's like an app on the blockchain, like an artificially intelligent such and such that sort of decides what career is best for you. What sort of fake job you would fit into the most? Make sure no one touches the sides of reality their whole life, and then they get recycled into soil and green or okay, so that, fertilizer. So that's what the cube is about. Because everybody has their own custom-designed game to play within this. Uh, you said it was a maze. It's like a 3D maze of some kind. Yeah, but the cube it's like a horror thing. So there's like saws that come out of the wall and like cut people and stuff. But I'd imagine, yeah. But then a smart city would surely be like that because when people yeah, you could call that the eugenic correcting factor in the algorithm of the smart city AI. Yeah, because they'll try and keep it within a Gaussian distribution of things so they can manage it. So they'll try and like, so they'll chainsaw all the fat cells onto the size. Um, basically, that's kind of what, what I see is going to happen. Well, yeah. Anyway. Can you get, run the the first sentence by me again, so I you know, I can chain all these ideas together? Okay, so Gaussian. So the difference between fractal distribution, Gaussian distribution. That's what Nassim Haramein goes on about. So data scientists and governments like to 
model things based on a Gaussian distribution because it allows because the numbers fit better. But actually, mm -hmm. in in reality, what you have is a fractal distribution with fat tail risks that um, the, the the academics can't account for because these fat tails don't fit into their models and they don't price risk properly. So it's the same with like distribution of people, distribution of ideas. They run along fat tails. And um, I'd imagine the smart cities, in order to make the data science algorithms work, would try and uh, clip the fat tails. So people like you and me, for example, we would probably be clipped off the side because we're too sort of Abnormal. too diff Yeah. Is this Nassim uh, Haramein the same person as oh, Nassim Nicholas T Taleb? Oh yeah, sorry, Nassim Har Haramein. He's the he's the physicist. Is Nicholas Nassim Taleb? That's who I'm who I mean. Yes, you're right. He's the the risk guy, Nicholas. Nassim okay, I, I was thinking that sounds exactly like the Black Swan idea. Yeah, it is the Black Swan idea. So okay. smart cities are basically Black Swan chain Black Swan chainsaw cubes. <laughs> okay. Uh, was there a question? Um, so, well, I basically, I guess we both agree because you're just laughing, and um, I guess that we both agree that that's like ultimately what's going to happen. So, it's not going to be oh, yeah. Utopia. It's going to be like Demolition Man, which is a movie you haven't seen yet, and you need I haven't to see. Seen Demo okay, I, I so have not seen Demolition. Demolition Man, all the Black Swan people escape underground and live live in the sewers, and they eat oh, rats. Okay. Do they do they become the Hollow Earth lizard men and, and secretly rule the thing at the end? Um, there is a sort of a Hegelian synthesis at the end type of a thing. Okay, I, I guess of sorts. Um. Any, anyway, get, getting back to the original thing. Yeah, that's that's what's going to happen because they'll want to do a utopian thing, and then, you know, man is a political animal. They're going to start trying to. Uh, put the put the fingers on the scale to get the the sorts of people that they want. Yeah, you can only breed the right kinds of uh, mind control slaves. At the Which, end of the day. you know, uh, there was a great book by Owen, yeah, Owen Stanley that uh, Fox put out called The Promethean, where the per, the I, I suppose the protagonist creates a machine that looks like him except thinner and more attractive. Which is basically what people would try to make with that sort of uh, arrangement. They would, like, we we need to make better people, and it would just happen to be people that look like them, except you know a little bit taller, a little bit more attractive, and just just, just thinner, you know, just what they want to eventually be themselves. Yeah, they can probably play American football, lacrosse, <laughs> but also score perfect SATs. Yeah, code in Python, JavaScript, make nice-looking apps. Yeah, that they is... can talk about at cocktail parties, you know. That's what that's what we should all be striving for ultimately. So, so next one, next we need to move quickly, Aoli. You're not moving. You're not staying at light speed. This is light speed. We're gonna achieve world peace with this um, with this podcast right now. So okay. you can't, by, you by can't the end achieve of it. To... world peace by going slow. We need to move quickly. <laughs> light, world peace light by a quarter two. Quickly. So. <laughs> TEDx 2040, California's neighboring states build a border wall 20 feet high in an attempt to contain the ensuing civil war. Yep. Yeah, I totally think so too. I mean, when people, I saw an RT documentary on California's Skid Row, it was LA Skid Row, and some guy, he stepped in human boo doo doo on the street, and he caught a flesh-eating bacterial infection that ate half his leg. And then since then, he was advocating for minimum UN uh, refugee camp sanitation standards for LA Skid Row. So when, when like the the great enabler of world peace and freedom can't provide minimum UN sanitation standards for its own homeless people, and there are like flesh-eating bacterial infections just lying in the street waiting to be stepped on. Um, I think we're kind of reaching an inflection point there, a, a paradigm shift, if you will, a sort of TED-like paradigm shift in how we should perceive the problem. What do you think? I, lo I lost track of the, the, the questions. All right. So it's civil the thing, war. Is, so the civil thing war. is going to happen. War. So all the, the, the we, culturally rich, uh, liberal, um, urban goodness in California 
uh, suddenly they're all catching flesh-eating bacterial infections. The, the UN sanitation standards suddenly don't extend to the ghettos of Inglewood. Yeah, or, well, hang on, hang on. I, I think what you're describing in the general sense is the weaponization of uh, importing uh, degeneracy, or uh, we'll, we'll say like uh, anarcho tyranny, except as a uh, as a weapon that you use in somebody else's domain, like which is it's something that we already do intensely. So let's say you want to uh, bring down the Russians or something. Well, what what you do is uh, get like put a bunch of uh, Georgians. You find the worst Georgians that you can, and then you move them across the border so that they cause extra trouble. You're just imposing costs on the on the infrastructure. Which is effectively the way that war is already fought. So what you're describing is sort of the, the the standardization of defenses against that. Into what's what's the word when it's like policy, except it's a standard uh, doctor, military doctor. Okay. So we're going to accept culture enrichment as an aspect of military and doc doctrine. That's your thing. Yeah. Okay, so we're gonna, it's gonna be a Clausewitzian paradigm shift, 2040, it's coming up, we should all be ready for it. So next yeah. one. I think next it's the one. movements in that. Alright. TEDx 2040, so we're, this is a huge paradigm shift. We're, Chinese supply MS-13 gang members with hypersonic fully autonomous kill drones. But not overtly. Yeah, as an, I mean, an extension of what we were talking yeah. about in the previous one. Yeah, but they, it's not like... They and they sort of announce the deal in a, in a in a press release type of thing. Okay, we're not we're not going to have a conversation on that. But essentially, Chinese-made weapons that are advanced will find their way into the hands of nefarious elements of the United States population. That is not even a little bit different from giving uh, Stinger missiles to the Taliban. No, it's not. It's the same. It's funny how karma works, isn't it? <laughs> Car karma is a bitch like that, and that's just how it goes. So, uh, next one. So these are all quite boring. Oh, next one. So, so shale fracking. This is super progressive and scientifically advanced. And uh, the, the flammability of tap water will be maintained autonomously by artificial intelligence. Would you like to give your thoughts on that? So it's going to be safe. So it's 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 going to be flammable, but it's going to be managed away by super advanced AI techniques. I don't even understand how that would happen. You're saying that the social uh, awareness of the problem would be managed away by AI, or the uh, the actual problem of flammable tap water would be managed? The actual that doesn't even make sense. The actual problem of flammable tap water. So I don't think we have AIs that can invent techniques for doing things, so I don't understand how it would do that. Do! You should, there's a, there's a real TEDx talk, it's actually real, and it's on AI and engineering design, and it's called, they have some fancy West Coast name for it, and it all sounds very impressive, but it, yeah, it designs stuff. Boeing, Boeing designed airplane parts using AI. Okay, so, but and, we're talking about... We're talking about solving an engineering problem versus uh, using a computer program to run some sort of... I mean, it would be like uh, saying that you ran a Monte Carlo simulation to solve the global warming. It's, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not within the domain of the problem. Or it's not within the domain of oh, the yeah, technique. Oh, well, yeah, well, see, this is just an interesting thing about robotics, because... AI and robotics, to me, they overlap. And it's like, where do you draw the Venn diagram? Because a robot, it has like the actuator sensors, but the AI could just be like the brain of it mm -hmm. that like takes the information. So I kind of, I'm not very uh, strict in how I use robotics and AI interchangeably. But let's say robots do it. So you have a robot okay, I'm in a water facility, better. and uh, yeah. Because I study robots, I know all about robots, so much so that I, I'm, I'm c giving you all my TEDx talk ideas for all the TEDx <laughs> talks I'm going to give on robots. All right, let me let me interject then. I knew okay. a guy who had a uh, an artificial leg with an AI built into it, which allowed him to uh, walk on it. So the the AI learned how he walked, and he learned how the AI 
helps him to walk. So he described the relationship with him and his knee as being something like a conversation while he walked. So he was constantly learning from it. It was constantly learning from him. There was a positive, positive feedback loop going on between the two. So it, it was a. So he described it as conversation. I think that engineering in particular and the professions in general are going to see a step increase in the the need for that sort of dialogue between them and their tools. So in that. In, in that sense, it could it could be used to solve any particular engineering problem given skilled operators, but it's okay, going it, so it's going to be something that's that will develop because who knows what the best practices will end up being for that sort of. See, I totally agree because thing. as as a technocrat, I'm looking to have more conversations with Asperger's nerds, so that's really something I can empathize with. Didn't I float the idea of writing? No, that was on the Discord. I, I floated the idea one time of writing a best practices for talking to people with Asperger's. Okay, I'm probably not following them, but this is for public <laughs> viewing. You have to think about the audience here as well. And uh, also, could you explain? Okay, let's divert for a second. Could you explain the difference? Because you say I'm very political, but I'm so keen on studying tech. Like I have a, an advanced degree from a great uni. Like I, I am former charter chemical engineer because I went to war on my institution, uh, but I was chartered. Like I am, I have all the nerd credentials, but we all know I'm not really a nerd. And you called me out for that, and I sort of agree. But sort of, what's the difference between my view of technology and my motivations? So you take someone my personality, and then you take a more kind of spurgy person, both with the same credentials. How are the, those two people different in in their intentions from the learning, and what they intend to do with it? It might be a mistake. It might be a mistake to describe people with Aspergers and nerds in general as apolitical. So. When I say that, I'm referring to essentially all human activity which is driven by the reproductive instinct and the survival instinct to be, I refer to those as political because those are expressed through uh, political, because the majority of, what am I saying here, we're social animals, we're political animals, that's the majority of our tool set majority of what matters in terms of actually fulfilling those desires in a complex uh, society, you know, where you have to get along with a lot of people, because that's, I mean, what, what matters is your status, your your, your position in uh, dominance hierarchies and so forth. So that's why I described that uh, all this, is, all activity which is driven by those things as political is because that's, the, that's our default tool set. And that's why, you know, the majority of technology is driven by political and uh, outright wartime considerations. Is because we don't actually care about those things for their own sake. They're, um, they're, they're means to ends, for the most part. You have to be... Like, e even if you, you, you're a person who is downright fascinated by those things, it can probably be traced back to the reproductive instinct in the in the final analysis to, to some extent. Um, I, it's an open question whether there's anybody who cares about you know something for its own sake. That's more of a philosophical question. <sighs> what was I getting at with that? Oh, so. Aeoli, this is so unentertaining. Entertainment oh. is entertaining for its own sake. Okay, we need to think about the audience here. But you're right. At the same time, you are right. It is kind of crazy to be interested in something for its own sake. Because that would be like uh, stamp collecting or something, right? And there, it's it's arguable whether that has any sort of function. But that might just be an outgrowth of something which once upon a time served a, a function other than, you know, that. 
That's interesting because the token collectors actually served a function to improve the quality of money in the UK during the Condor token revolution. How about that? And then, yeah. I, and same with stamps. I mean, when it's a totally free market in stamps, for example, you might want people, you might want to create a market demand in the best quality stamps from the collectors to, to increase production in better quality stamps. And then over time, the better quality stamps sell more, and those companies make more profit, do better, outcompete the lower quality ones. Right. But, so was that, but were they stamp collecting because I was a group selected? Uh, Trade? They're doing because they enjoy it. No, you do it because you enjoy it. But like this kind of like innocent joy in like kind of innocent things. And at the time, it was very exciting. Like imagine the postal service at the time. Oh, you can send a letter to anyone anywhere in the UK for a penny. Anyone could afford it. Wow, that's really amazing, isn't it? Same with uh, yeah. Same with the trains. Same with Condor tokens. All these kind of economic revolutions. You have people who are like super obsessed with the thing itself and that helps drive the the uh, business people towards excellence because we all know business people are pretty lazy and if unless they have you know they need those incentives to be excellent right the <laughs> the personality profile of a an entrepreneur actually typically selects for low conscientiousness because there's a there's a component of that which cares a lot about what is expected of you. And somebody who wants to go off and do their own thing is typically going to be more interested in their own vision. Where was it? How did I get off? Okay. That? That's a good point. That's a good point. So at what point is it okay? Okay, because you're you're a highly conscientious person. We all know this. At what point in a man's life or a woman's life is it are you allowed to say, you know what, fuck all this shit. I it's okay, it's fine. It does what it's supposed to do. I but I've been there and done that. And I've got the seventh level black belt in the basic shit. Now what at what point is that kind of samurai level achieved where it's sort of where, it, where it's not just sort of you're the, the next American creating the next best burger, but it's someone actually doing something worthwhile. Okay. How do you think that process happens? Because there's different kinds of entrepreneurs. I think. So if I may yeah, express it, this it, it, in it, your it, idiom, at what okay. point does Musashi stop uh, learning just one sword and pick up the second sword and invent his own style to get even more base? Was that, was that too far out? Do you know the Musashi yeah, reference? Fine. Dude, dude, I love that book. I love that guy. I'm from Aberdeen. And you know, Aberdeen is very big on Japanese culture because we helped to industrialize Japan, our city. We I had no idea. Action with Japan. Wasn't Thomas that the Dutch? Blake Glover, Thomas Blake Glover, The Last Samurai, you know that, to that movie with uh, Tom Cruise? I thought that was made up, to be honest. It was loosely based on the life of a guy called Thomas Blake Glover, who was from Aberdeen. And he fa he was a co-founder of Mitsub Mitsubishi Corporation. So there you go. Huh. So yes, in Aberdeen, we know all about this kind of stuff because we have the strong heritage. So I, that being said, you, yeah, continue. I had no idea that the, the shoot, what are they called, the, the anime-loving white person? I didn't realize that it had historical roots. Dude, it does. We, Thomas Blake Glover, he shipped, he sold uh, specialized ships to Japan that were only made in Aberdeen. He took uh, uh, tribal leaders from Japan back to the UK to learn about manufacturing and industrialization. Took them to Aberdeen, to London. Uh, yeah, it's a very interesting book. It, 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 there's a book about Thomas Blake Glover. You should read it. Being a, a weeaboo who's who likes My Little Pony and shit like that, like, you'd like <laughs> I, I can't read. I, it's degenerate. I'm offended that you'd even suggest I couldn't read. Anywho, do you want to go to the next one? I lost track of what we were talking about. Uh, Okay, next one. AI autonomously dictates government policy on behalf of the City of London to the British Civil Service. 
So instead of having the complex negotiations and, you know, having the piles of compromise on either side, sending each other the prostitutes and the drugs, just do away with that, massively increase efficiency, and just do it all via AI. What are your thoughts on that? So they actually do that in Evangelion. Their society is run by three supercomputers sort of interacting with each other like branches of government, which is kind of neat. Would it work, and is it going to happen? If it happens, I think it would be by accident of what we were talking about before, the professionals interacting with their AI tools, which learn from each other, and then the tools simply becoming superlative in the relationship. So that would be an example of, it would be similar to people today using tools that they don't understand. And, you know, it's not a sustainable situation, so that would probably fall apart after such and such generations of people who are operators and not designers. Did that make any sense? It did. Yeah, it made perfect sense. It's sort of like along the lines of all your other things. You kind of make me feel like all my edgy TEDx talk titles are actually just the titles of animes that haven't been made yet, which is making me feel quite bad. You know, what... I'm lowering your social status just by association. What's the line between edgy... So you know Sam Hyde, right? What's the line between edgy like Sam Hyde, Million Dollar Extreme, you get banned from Adult Swim, so he's like the peak edgelord, and even like the chads are like scared of how edgy he is, which just makes him like extra super edgy. Like he's the MP who's just like terrifying, and he'll just turn you into mush with his super Godzilla robot with laser beam eyes. And he sort of... Yeah, that's what interests me. It's like, because he's not totally socially unacceptable, but that makes him totally cool, kind of like Kurt Cobain. I think America... What's interesting about America is it has this habit of creating these kinds of fringe people who are just too so cool that they just fall off the edge, and they just become these, like, living legends. So could you speak to that? Like, and also, what's the difference between, like, a Sam Hyde and an anime? And why is anime uncool, but Sam Hyde is cool? Sam Hyde is the personification of 4chan. But that makes him sound uncool, but he's actually cool. Right, well, that's because 4chan, if you look at it from outside, is cool. As long as you aren't actually in it and on it, the effect of it is cool. But the internals of it are not. So that's why I would say that... Because... I'm not going to be able to get into that more because I don't understand it. But the difference between why he's cool and why... Hang on, i got to turn up on this up again. We are currently experiencing an intermission in service. Oh... And yeah, he's yeah. back. Ilya's back. Alright, so the difference between cool and uncool is the ability to perform in a socially nuanced situation. To be able to navigate in, in the moment. So Sam Hyde is able to actually navigate the uh, structures that he's criticizing versus a, an autiste is somebody who can describe it from the outside but doesn't have the facility in actually navigating things. So he can't, he can't, he, he might be able to deconstruct the, the dominance hierarchy, but he can't uh, rise within it because he, he simply lacks the, the skills and the ability. So it's a matter of uh, being unable to behave according to the rules. Versus being able to and choosing not to is the big distinction. So basically, cartoons are against the rules. Right, because 
Uh, a cartoon is a low resolution uh, expression of humanity. Uh, there's a reason it looks more like a children's drawing, is because it's a very. Um, it, it, it completely lacks nuance and expression. Like a cartoon character, you can always tell exactly what single emotion that they're trying, they're expressing with their face. Versus a, a good actor in a movie, there's, they're going to be displaying micro expressions, lots of uh, nuance and mixed emotions in their face. It's uh, so it's a, a matter of complexity. So car car cartoons are not cool because they. They're childish. They're literally childish expressions of uh, very simple emotions and ideas. So even if you can break a thing down into, even if you can describe the thing at a macro level in simplified terms, like for example the formula I was talking about earlier where you have the genetic distance, social mood, and uh, GDP per capita. Uh, being able to predict, predict war, like you, you could express that in a cartoon, but it wouldn't be cool because you can't use that information to. Uh, the kids here, I can't, I can't swear. I'll keep it PG. To to hey. get women and and money and and status and so forth. So, but it, it's, it's not it's, useful information. It's not useful and cool. It's a time of what is cool. Is Vitalik Buterin cool? The guy who invented the oh. I, I don't know that much about him. I think he would probably be cool to people who can understand what he's talking about because his ideas are useful for getting what they want. True, and, and because he invented it, he must be like a billionaire now. So that helps. I don't know. Is he? Probably. He probably has like billions of dollars in ether. I, I would recommend looking into that because... Maybe he's bad with money, I don't know. But is, is he cool? I would like to meet him myself. I, but I, I, I'm reliably a bad indicator of what's cool. I would have told you Twitter was a terrible idea. But it's, it's, see, it's interesting because it just seems to come down to a function of power. And it seems that there's people, they sort of float to the bottom of one paradigm of how society works and then they sort of reinvent a new one so basically sam hyde was able to act upon all the autistic observations that 4chan made and mm -hmm. turn it into something and then that makes him cool yeah because he's a fundamentally a people person but he can understand systems so the people who are systems thinkers we're able to explain and deconstruct the system for him. He uses that to make his criticisms, and because he's also able to navigate those systems by, uh, you know, learned behaviors and so forth, he's he's still cool. He's a he's an outsider. He's edgy, and all that nonsense. But the the source of his he, he he's so, leveraging what it, the, the tools that people built. So he's a, it, it's Sam, it's, it's Sam Hyde a sigma? Is he a sociosexual sigma? Would you say? I would have to be more familiar with him to say because that's what you're describing is uh, social function versus sociosexual status, which is far more of a, an emotional state. And you think? sure, they, they they line up sometimes, but it's not a perfect course. Okay, so it's like two waves that are sometimes in harmony, but they have a different periodicity or whatever. Yeah, a person who acts as a what we'll say a comedian is not necessarily going to fulfill the role of a, we'll say a potential political dissident. Uh huh. Even though it seems like they should. In fact, if you find that uh, comedians are typically very low, uh, low status in like interpersonal terms. Mm. So. With that being so, they're co they're compensating for something. Yeah, it, and I mean there are a few different selection mechanisms there. Like the the most obvious is that a person with outsider status is going to have a, a better inside look at the things that they're criticizing to produce their humor, right? Uh huh. So they're just going to have better observations, and that makes them better at the job. 
Um, so what 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 differentiates what differentiates like a sigma from like uh, what's below delta? Uh, omega. Yeah. What's so what what are the prime differentiators between someone who's like comfortable on the outside, cool, like not threatened by all the shit, can like dip in and out as and when they want, and someone who's like. Because it's interesting, I sent you that school shooter composite, and it was quite... It had, a, like, an owl melon tinge to it, but it had, like, a bit of, like, rec chin and, like, a bit of basic features to it. But it seems to me that there's, like, there is this... There's, there, there's like, sim a weird similarity there between, like, gamma traits and, like, owly traits. What would you say? Especially when it's like the degenerate culture phase. Because you, like, you I, get, get like Al Mellon's just rage quitting. Like, I'd imagine Elliot Roger would be like a highly functioning member of American society in like 1932. Mm, I do not. I disagree with that. Uh, just, just looking at the factors that produced him. I, all right, so why, why was Elliot Roger the way that he was? He had a bad father figure. He has probably a genetic issue, in, just in a general sense, which, you know, he's... And probably, probably an over, either an overbearing mother or... Uh, the opposite. Uh, what, what's over enabling, I suppose, would be the word. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't think you can have those features and function well in any sort of society. Because he was living in a pretty serious delusion bubble, it, accompanied by a pretty strong sense of entitlement, um, and all of this facilitated by wealth to have. To overcome every problem except uh, overcoming his alienation. So I don't, I don't suppose that. Like, if, if he took all of his money away and dumped him in the wild, basically, then he might eventually develop coping mechanisms that will allow him to function. But I. He, he had a lot of things stacked against him. He had a lot in his favor, though. He was well-spoken. He was well-educated. These kinds of things used to mean something. He was wealthy. He came from a wealthy background. I, you could give him a business, and he could have run it, I think. Yeah, it, it's plausible that he could have risen to, say, a supervisor position, and then terrorized the people under him. That's the sort of thing you would expect from that personality, but in terms of overcoming the, the alienation, I, I don't think he would ever... I don't think he had much of a shot of that in any sort of society. Because he, he was, uh, I hesitate to say damaged goods, but he had a lot of things working against him. So I just don't give him good odds. Okay. See, I personally, I'm like fairly empathetic. I think we're coming to the end of a very degenerate age, and actually people have forgotten, like, Elliot Rogers own had a lot of actual, like, traditional um, values, understandings, tacit knowledge that's, like, passed down, and, yeah, maybe his mo mo boomer mother and father weren't so great, but... They, they were a great deal worse than average. Yeah. But I think, I think the guy had a lot to offer, and it's actually, um, we need to take these people who feel, because he's actually, like, quite creative, and you could see him trying to break out of his delusion bubble with his YouTube videos, like, trying to understand, like, the level that people are on today. Um, you know, I see it as a, a lot of failure of society, that we can't find a place for, like, high IQ, well-spoken kind of interesting people, and he did, he did have a lot to offer, I think. I think it's unfair to say that he didn't. I think he did. I, I tried not, reading not, some of his manifesto, and it was bad. 
Yeah, it was probably bad, but you, could, you got to start from somewhere. He tried, at least. You could see that he's trying to make things. But he didn't have, like, a, a role model who he could bounce ideas off, like a guru, a mentor. You know, he was... So, yeah, in that way... I kind of see where you're coming from, but I just see a lot of people like that out there now, kind of smart people, capable people, young, like good men who actually have ideas to drive society forward, do good things, and um, I think people are like too quick to put them in that kind of bucket, when if they'd actually been given the education that they needed for their level of what they... Oh, really I see what you're saying. Okay, so you're... You're saying he's, give him some direction, give him some uh, role models, at least in his yeah. uh, social life, if not in his family life. Because he's officer class. He is. He's probably a high IQ. You know, you point him at the enemy, he'd go fucking kill the lot of them. You know, you need people like that. That's what I think, anyway. I, I agree. He wasn't without virtues. I hesitate to describe him as high IQ after reading any of what he wrote, but... He did have he did have some qualities. There there's a usefulness to idealism too, just in the general sense. Like you, you want your you don't want to be you don't want to you don't want to be around pragmatists because even though they are going to be more realistic, there's a, they're a buzzkill basically. They're not well, ma they're not magnetizing. Like he could have been. Ultimately, you, you can't put trust him. Them. You put him in a nice uniform, military uniform. Give him a decent artillery officer's education. Send him off to kill the terrorists. He'd do a great fucking job. But why aren't why aren't we doing that? And instead, we impl we we have like uh, Burger McBurger fat as like SWAT team officers, as police, as military officers blah 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 like when when the u.s military is so full of corruption and drug dealing and blah 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 like of course there's no room for an idealist like that of course he's gonna rage quit i mean if you actually and expecting like young impressionable men who are trying to like who are idealists to actually try and fathom the world that boomers have made basically which is just a fucking clusterfuck like of course you're gonna get these people falling off the side i mean no wonder why he was rising he was probably so mashed off his brains on zoloft or whatever they were giving him by the by the end of course of course he's gonna go and write like the, uh, some shitty version of the unibomber manifesto because you know how's how did how's zoloft gonna save him how's zoloft gonna get him like the inner uh nutrition that he really needs for his soul to give him purpose direction all these kinds of things so anyway that's my opinion on the thing it's a shame how how a lot of people are turning out and how how uh, incels as well give your thoughts on incels well he was kind of the leading edge of generation z in that way a lot of people are turning it out that way because they've, yeah, they're just being absolutely crushed. So, uh, incels in a general sense. Uh, what is there to say? If you got, are, are we if you getting have, too if, black pill here? Do we need to take? Do we need to pause? Is it becoming too triggering? Because if it is. This is, this is the place I'm comfortable. This is what I wanted from our podcast, is we really get into the meat and the juice and the guts of the thing. Because this is, this is the most interesting thing for me. Because right now you have this shit fight happening over all these issues. No one wants to talk about it. But I want, what I had envisioned for this podcast is like, we would open the lid on this stuff in, in a way that's like, critical, but fairly like empathetic and compassionate, like deconstruct it. And in a way where, Anyone could come along. Chad could come along. Stacy could come along. Virgin could come along. Elliot Roger could come along. Like, I don't care who you are, where you're from, but we can all like come together and actually say, okay, my life is fucked up, or my life is great. It doesn't matter. But well, let's let's actually explore it in a compassionate way because there are like every business owner wants smart people idealists who go out and sell their products kind of thing and Elliot Roger could have been that guy Elliot Roger in my opinion could have sold like 10 million dollars of products for a business 
So, but now he ended up shooting up a thing. So, you know, there is a there's a definite economic value, social value from turning these things around into like positives and stopping the like, the negativity and act, and, uh, and and trying to have constructive conversations over it. So, I, I see we're getting to like a level that's tough to speak, but we took in a deep breath <laughs> to, to oh, it's getting a bit too difficult. But this is this is the. This is the last sort of five miles of the marathon. You know, this is the part that counts. I feel. So anyway, that being said. All right. Well, I got to be done uh, by the time the clock ticks over to the next hour. Okay. So, so do you want to put that off to the next time, or do you want me we, to try to tackle it in two sentences? Let's. Well, it's seven minutes to six now. Let's give it. Try and give it five minutes. Let's just touch on it, and then this can set the stage for the next one. All right. So it comes down to uh, the feedback system between structural and individual. We've lost the individual part because that uh, the next generation has no concept of the radical individualism that is assumed by baby boomers and earlier. So that has been that, that's entirely lost. Now. That's it's not even a factor in their day-to-day -day experience or worldview. don't think that's generally a good thing, but it's something that we have to account for. Uh, in terms of structural, there are more people in the younger generations who are damaged because there are a lot of things working working against them, and if they were removed, a lot of them could do something con constructive with their lives. I think a really strong analysis of so it's a strong, in-depth, and comprehensive analysis of what is actually working against them would reveal a lot of easy places to make changes that would help them out. There, there are probably a lot of obstacles that could be routed around simply by awareness of them, and there aren't a lot of people looking at that because, generally speaking, in, in America at least, uh, the, the issues which confront the young, so that would be people in high school or younger, are just ignored because they're out of sight, out of mind to their parents and, you know, generations above them. There's a very strong segregation of age groups over here. And that's probably true in uh, Europe as well. But it's, it's, uh, it's also true in church. Like, if you go to most churches, the, the age groups will be split up and sent to different classes. So I think... In terms of the things that are working against, we'll, we'll say young men in particular, the, the sort of insult phenomenon is due to a simple disinterest and the, the, um, the structures which are actually being built to crush them by people who legitimately hate them because we, we have a, a sort of social and intellectual elite now that are, have not that, that don't even make the pretense of trying to build sustainable institutions. They are actively working to create an uns unsustainable situation because that's how you conduct war. Which is something that we touched on earlier about how that's becoming military doctrine. Sl slowly, but we're, we're adapting to that situation. Yeah, so it's sort of the, they, they, they are I, like how I how I describe it. It's sort of like. Nashian concusopoly game theory became institutionalized and that, that's what we're dealing with now. So in that way you can actually understand it.